Part of this topic today, uh, we have a caller, so we're calling in. Um, Keisha uh, Jackson is an Air Force retired veteran and family uh, caregiver. Uh, she is a 22-year retired Air Force veteran after caring for her mother who had stage 4 inoperable lung cancer. Keisha started learning about caregiver resources to share with other caregivers. We also have with us Bobby uh, Carducci is a certified caregiving consultant and educator. She is a caregiver support uh, group leader and international speaker on dementia related caregiving issues and the author of two books for caregivers. Bobby also co hosts uh, the weekly podcast Roger That Show and her husband Mike. Uh, she also, the podcast is dedicated to guiding you through the heavy haze of dementia. Very welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we are so happy to have you here. Uh, maybe you can start us off, Keisha, and tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing. Sure. Um, hopefully everyone is doing well. Yes. I wanted to uh, talk about the topic of dementia a little bit today. Um, dementia care is, is really stressful for caregivers. Um, because of dementia, it causes, you know, some caregivers, like, from different things ranging from anger to rage to guilt to losing patience um, with the person that they're caring for. Um, it costs caregivers to feel like they may potentially be doing something wrong, um, all of which can lead to being, because they're tired, because they're overstressed, you know, it, it um, can cause them to think they're not doing a good do job. So I thought Bobby would be a great person to be on the show today to talk a little bit about uh, dementia in terms of finding the yes to reduce the stress for those caring for um, um, patients and loved ones with dementia. Oh, thank you. Okay, Bobby, you can, you can go and tell us a little bit more about the, uh, you know, certified caregiving, uh, uh, you know, consultant role you play and the educational role you play uh, in this sphere. So let us know more, more about this. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show today. Mm -hmm. um, as a caregiving consultant, I do one-on-one -on -one, um, consulting by phone or now via Zoom with caregivers who need assistance with whatever's going on in their day to day caregiving world. As an educator, I present uh, webinars and speak in public when, when um, you know, it's possible to educate as many people as, uh, as I can about dementia behaviors and how to respond to them in such a way that it reduces the stress for both them and the person that they're caring for. And part of the reason that caregivers become so stressed is they don't understand the dementia brain and um, what happens with someone with dementia and how they process information. Oh, yes. You know, wow, now that's, that's something that uh, I'm sure, Doc, a lot of us didn't know about. Uh, that's a, a great response. Tell us, tell us about that, please. Um, this is Cliff. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Hello, Cliff. Um, it's it's nice to talk to you. Um, people think of dementia as a memory problem. You know, we understand that you know short term memory goes away, but they don't really understand that um, it's actually brain atrophy, and over time the brain shrinks. It becomes less pliable. Connections that um, that help us think um, get broken and they don't work anymore. And when you consider that the brain controls everything about us from the time that we're born, our sight, our vision, our balance, our reason, even our very heartbeat, um, this is a huge, uh, deadly disease. It's 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 definitely fatal. It's a long-term disease. Some caregivers are caring for someone with dementia for as long as 15 to 20 years. Mm. Um, but what's frustrating mostly for the, for the family caregiver is not understanding that for someone with dementia, their world, what they think is, is real to them, is ours is to us. So if someone mm -hmm. with dementia says they want to go home, it's not going to do you any good to tell them that they are home, that they've lived with you for the last five years. Yeah. They don't recognize where they are. Um, so the challenge is to find out what ex exactly the, it is that they're asking for. It, 
probably not the house, the home that they lived in before they came to live with you. It could be their childhood home, or it could simply be the feeling that we all want to have when we're safe and under our parents' care. So in order to find uh, to find a yes, we need to find out what exactly it is that they're looking for and to respond to that. Yeah, and, and, you know, dementia has many causes or underlying uh, conditions that can lead to the state of uh, being uh, having dementia. Um, but I, I'm wondering, you know, it, does, you know, do you see that there's a need for a proper diagnosis? Because I would imagine the offer and the services that you would give them uh, would depend uh, heavily on making sure that you're, you know, dealing with something that maybe doesn't have an underlying correctable condition or something that can actually um, make the situation better if you addressed one aspect of the dementia. That's absolutely true. Getting the correct um, diagnosis is absolutely critical. And sometimes some of these behaviors, especially in the early stages, can be the result of drug interactions. So you, you need to get a diagnosis. Absolutely. Start with the um, with the doctor that knows you best, the person that you've gone to for several years, and then if they say this looks like a, like a form of dementia, then you want to go to a neurologist. Wow. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because he says that you know you're a caregiver, but also you know support group leader. So what what does that involve? The support group uh, function. How how does that happen, and how do you interact with the person who has dementia in that setting? Um, up until COVID, it was it, uh -huh. we had a group that met at a local senior center, and these were all people that were caring for family members that had some form of dementia. And I was there as, as a trained support group leader, but since there's absolutely no experts in dealing with dementia, anybody that was in that room brought some information that was helpful to the others. And some of these people have been in that group for five or six years from the time their loved one first was diagnosed and were in the early stages and now are much further along. Oh, that's really a very, very important uh, a point you're making because recent, you know, recently with the COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, many people are starting to turn to telemedicine, uh, to telehealth. And, uh, you know, in, particularly in psychiatry, psychology, in that realm, uh, they have been uh, using that uh, for people with, um, you know, mental health issues that they can actually interact with. But here in dementia, that might be more challenging, I would imagine. Um, doctor visits can, can be done that way. And uh, what we've done is we've moved that caregiver support group uh, to an online Zoom meeting. Um, uh -huh. And that's actually turned out to to work well for some people who weren't able to leave their loved one at home to go to an in-person group. Oh. So, so I, you know, actually getting um, people that I hadn't been able to reach before. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, you know, so what would you uh, suggest to caregivers? Because I, I hear all the time, you know, that uh, people who are giving care, you know, you need to have care for the caregiver. <laughs> so are, are there things that you would recommend or, you know, what, what do you think about that particular issue? Um, Bobby, 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 before you answer that or in, in addition to, to that, um, if you don't mind, can you maybe include some of your experience of being a caregiver for um, someone with dementia? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, I was a caregiver, the, the primary caregiver for my father-in-law, Roger, for seven years. He came to live with us when my mother-in-law passed away, and he had multiple issues. He had dementia. He had Parkinson's. Um, he had COPD. He was a lifelong schizophrenic. Um, he had what I call stubborn old Italian disease. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he was, he was my first teacher when it came to uh, dealing with dementia. Oh, boy. So how, what, what kind of impact was that on your life, and how, how did you, because uh, it sounds like you had a really loving relationship in that, uh, that you, you know, gave a lot of emotional support to, uh, just from the way you're presenting what you're saying. So what was Well, that he was like? an absolutely amazing man, but there were days when I didn't like him very much, and he didn't mm -hmm. like me very much either. Mm -hmm. sure. But we absolutely loved one another. Yeah. And um, while some caregivers say they probably wouldn't want to be a caregiver again. I would do it in a heartbeat because I consider it a gift I didn't know I wanted. Ah, 
Fantastic. And, uh, you know, so, so you know, how, how should a, what is a typical day like in caregiving? You, you, so you wake up in the morning and how, how does that, um, how do you sort of intertwine with that role? Because you have other things that you're doing, I'm sure, you know, uh, you know, uh, shopping for groceries, doing uh, work and other things, other activities that you do in your life. So how, do, how does that intertwine with your role and what you have to do during a, a normal day? Now, when, during my years as a caregiver, uh, I ended up actually leaving my corporate job mm-hmm. um, to stay home with my father-in-law. And fortunately, we were able to do that. Um, and so my day always started with um, getting him up, getting him dressed, doing his early medications, getting him cleaned up um, and uh, settled for the morning. He liked to watch the TV news, so that that kind of kept him occupied for a while. But scheduling was was extremely important to him. Now, um, more and more working caregivers are having to deal with, um, you know, going to work and, and trying to figure out how to balance all this. And then with COVID, more and more family members are at home. So what I'm advising people to do now is put those uh, youngsters and the spouse that are typically gone during the day to work and take care of some of the day-to-day household chores and take some of that work off the shoulders of the person that's actually dealing with the person with dementia. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so you know, because you were uh, the, for dementia, it was like finding the yes to reduce the stress. So, what is the yes? <laughs> but, you know, how do we uh, work to reduce the stress in those situations? Um, so, uh, you don't want to ask a yes or no question. You don't want to ask somebody with dementia if they if they're hungry, because uh-huh. they'll nine times out of ten they're going to say no. And the reason that they say no is it's very easy to say. It's one of the very first words we learn as an infant, and it has a good deal of power. And if they don't understand what you're saying, their response is going to be no. So rather than saying, would you like to eat, you put food in front of them, you sit down, and even if it's just a snack, you have something with them, and and they mimic what you're doing. Um, oh, I see. If somebody, if somebody says they don't want to take a shower, you don't want to insist. One of my buzzwords is if they if they resist, don't insist. You suggest, and if they say no, you walk away, give them time to think about it. And uh, one thing that I sometimes suggest is, you know, get a pair of, of scrubs like doctors and nurses wear, they're not that expensive, put them on, walk into the room. Hello, Mr. Carducci. Um, Doctor says it's time for your shower. Let's get you in there. And we don't give Mm -hmm. them a choice. Oh, phenomenal. Um, You know, are there any resources or places that people can reach out to that you're aware of? you know, if they want to get uh, information or, or feel, because I'm, I'm sure that people, when they get into this situation, especially for the first time or early on in that caregiving role, they uh, have to f- adjust to it and figure out, you know, what do I need or what kind of resources should I do? So if someone finds themselves in that situation, especially now, we, we do have the COVID uh, crisis going on now, so people are getting, you know, closer and closer to their families. Um, and uh, there, there may be, um, you know, a more of a stress because everyone's staying home, we're doing social distancing, using masks. You know, is there, is there anything that people can do to uh, sort of break into this kind of situation if it's new to them or any resources they can turn to if they're stressed about it? Well, the Alzheimer's organization, of course, is a great resource, and that's online, and it has um, a great deal of information about the different types of dementia, um, local doctors, local support groups, whether or not they're in person or if they're online, like the one that I have. There are multiple dementia support groups on Facebook. I belong to a a lot of those. Um, I do webinars, um, online webinars, so somebody can get in touch with me. I certainly encourage people to become knowledgeable about dementia 
as early as possible. I, I developed a program called Prepare to Care, what every adult needs to know about Alzheimer's and dementia before and after it strikes home, because actually dementia is a huge pandemic, worldwide pandemic in itself, with millions of people being diagnosed every year. Uh, and that's really interesting, because one of the things, too, is that you know, we also have uh, other medical conditions, you know, chronic medical uh, illnesses like diabetes and hypertension. Those don't necessarily go away. <laughs> and uh, so it seems like it's, if you're doing the care for the dementia, sometimes you also have to encounter some of those other um, medical conditions that are occurring as well. Absolutely. And very often those med medications interact in a way that, that doesn't, that may be detrimental to one or the other. And in fact, they're now calling type 2 de uh, dementia or type 2 diabetes another form of dementia because it affects uh, the vascular uh, part of the brain and can lead uh -huh. to dementia. Uh -huh. And we had multiple co uh, morbidities with, with that. Like I said, we had, we had Parkinson's, we had schizophrenia, we had Lewy body dementia. Um, we had a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> Yes. And, you know, you know, and Keisha, you also had the same kind of um, uh, thing that you had to go through as well with your mom uh, with uh, the lung cancer. I had to go through that with my mother who had a stroke who passed away. Um, but, you know, so, so tell me a little bit more about, you know, what was that like and how, you know, what do you recommend for people to do as well? Well, one of the first things that I definitely recommend, whether it's caring for a person with dementia or lung cancer, although it's so hard to stay care for yourself, is so very, very much needed. And sometimes you have a support group, sometimes you don't, you know, sometimes it's your family, sometimes it's not. But one of the best things that we're trying to do through this show and through other things is to try to educate people as early as possible before things happen. And so I find early education, even if it's not something that you do on a regular, you may be able to say, oh, that's right. I remember that someone said this or someone said that. But for us in the military, we also have the, um, the Veterans Administration, mm -hmm. so we can always reach out to them for in, um, information. Like Bobby mentioned, there's the um, Facebook pages. There's all of these different groups. Um, you have your church support. You have a lot of different things. Um, for me, when I was caring for my mom, I had my brothers who were there. I had family members, so um, it was very, very tiresome. But it, you also, I also had help to kind of spread some of the um, the long nights and the and the long mornings. But going back to um, the dementia, um, I was mentioning that it's best to know things early as early as possible. But I was reading something today, and it said nearly there's a new case like every three seconds um, discovered of the dementia. And it says by 2000, wow. yeah, by 2030, it will be like 82 million people. And then by 2050, 152 million cases of dementia. And so early education is one of the best things that we hope we can do to help someone else. Oh, fantastic. So we, we need to be teaching working age adults in their 30s and 40s because you figure in the next 10 to 15 years, they're going to be taking care of their spouses, not just their parents. 